on record. All righty, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to tonight's Share the Knowledge, sponsored by the HCRA. Um, these are little 30 to 60 minute um, specialty sessions that we do a couple times a month, especially during the winter months when everybody's inside and it's cold outside. Um, tonight we have uh, Dom and one DM, right? Right. Okay. Um, who's going to talk to us about uh, FD8 and FD4, an introduction to it. And uh, more and more people are popping in here, but um, uh, the floor is yours, Dom. Okay. Let me try sharing here. Let me see if it, uh, are you seeing this? Nope, just you. Okay, hold on a minute. Let's go back. Yeah, I've got the share and on. And hit share screen. And let's, oh, this looks like it, it may work. Let's try that. There we go. Okay, good. So all I got to do is start the slideshow mode. So good evening. And, uh, Let's see, I'm just going to close some of this other stuff so I don't see it all going away. So in any case, um, welcome to my little discussion of FT4 and FT8. A little introduction. I'm in Natick, Mass. I've been a ham, effective November of this year, I'll have 50 years licensed. I'm active in a bunch of different things. Uh, I got active in FT8 after the 2019 Dayton Hamvention. Uh, in July, I decided to go on. Uh, as an introduction, I've been, I was an RTTY in the 70s with the mechanical Model 15 teletype machine. So it's, I have a, quite a few years of doing all this kind of stuff. Uh, I won't tell you how many computers I've been through in different versions. So we'll talk about FT8 and FT4 tonight. Uh, FT8 is a digital mode. It's basically a keyboard mode. And it, it gives you a contest type exchange that basically has a grid square and a signal report. Uh, unlike RST reports we're all familiar with, the signal reports are relative to the noise floor because that's how the system calculates the signal level and a four character grid square. So like where I'm in Eastern Mass, I'm in gr grid FN 42. Uh, there is, not a current QSO mode in FT8 and FT4, but at the end, I'm going to discuss another piece of software that's come out, to, and I'll use the term loosely, cure that. The big kicker on FT8 and FT4 is that they work well into the noise. Literally a signal you can't hear on CW, 20 dB below the noise floor, you'll be able to work. Um, so it's kind of an interesting mode in that it, it kind of, helps out the people who have limited signal capability, QRP stations, stations with limited antennas, uh, a lot of POTA stations are heard on it. It uses automatic sequencing. So once you start a QSO with somebody, the computer now takes over and goes back and forth and, arrange, and gets all the necessary information. It uses fixed time slots. And as a result, the clock time of your computer is critical. I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. FT8 became available in June of 2017, and about a year and a half later was followed by FT4. And you might ask why FT4 showed up. FT4 showed up because the contest and DX community wanted something a little faster than FT8. FT8 takes a, a between a minute and a minute and 15 seconds to complete a QSO, not exactly contest style speeds. FT4 is half of that. So FT4 was a follow on. Again, doesn't require high power, a 30 to 50 watt output at your radio to a simple antenna will work fine. Uh, you, your radio has to be capable of SSB in the USB mode on any band you want to use it. Um, We'll talk a little about radio interfaces in a couple of slides, but if you have a PC sound card interface, great, that you use for teletype of PSK31. Some of you may have newer radios like the ICOM 7300 and the FT101, which have the sound cards built in, in which case you don't need an interface. Uh, one of the 
misconceptions comes up is because FT8 and FT4 have the capability to interface with the radio, if you don't interface your radio, it won't work. Or if you don't have a radio that has CAT controls, computer rated controls, uh, the radio will not work. Incorrect. You can use a, an older radio that doesn't have computer controls and set the frequency and the power. Or if you have a newer radio, you can use the PC to do that. It generates a contact log that can go into your favorite logger. I use N3FJP. A lot of people use N1MM. It accepts all that. And so I think ham radio deluxe, as I recall, also. Once you start a queue, so again, this will automatically repeat the messages to try to get through. It was originally designed as a weak signal mode for meteor scatter, which obviously is not great communications. And so it had a, a capability to repeat until it made a Q cell. Um, and if you don't like what's going on, you can hit the halt button and it'll stop trying. Under normal conditions, FT8 takes a minute, a minute, 15 seconds. FT40 takes literally half of that. Um, the biggest advantage, uh, FT8 is part of a package called WSJTX, which is free from K1JT. For the users who don't know who K1JT, K1JT is Joe Taylor. Joe is a Nobel Prize winner in astrophysics. He has a Nobel Prize in physics, obviously. He is, an, uh, he is very competent in all these low signal activities. He's an active EME operator, meteor scatter, and he developed these programs to help that. The current version is 254. Uh, if you have any PC running Windows 7, 8, or 10, or even uh, told 11 works too, I haven't tried 11 yet, you should have no trouble. The only uh, kicker in this is you need to have an audio device on the PC with 48K of sampling at 16 bits, which basically means within the last four or five years, the, uh, almost every PC's had that. If it doesn't, you're gonna have a problem with uh, the audio controls on this. WSJT, for those of you who have Max, is available with Max. It's available on the Linux. It has available uh, code for Raspberry Pis. So it's very usable on every system. All of them are currently at version 254. Uh, like I said earlier, you can go directly to your sound card interface, uh, and, or, or you can go to your radio if your radio has internal sound cards. Uh, why one of the reasons people have used interface over the years is for DC isolation to transmit receive audio. Some older radios, if you try to couple low level audio in, would pick up hum and all that great stuff from the computer switching power supplies. Uh, it also allows for PTT keying. Somebody always asks, so I'll tell you, I use a Tigatronic signal link interface because I have an ICOM 746 Pro that does not have its own sound card. Uh, I've been using the signal link for years on RTTY, PSK31, all these modes, and it works great. Uh, it's nice because you buy the signal link offers a variety of cables and jumper modules. So you can use it with almost every radio made in the last 20 years. Uh, when you do download the SWSJT program, it includes all these programs. And you'll notice a lot of them are weak signal, EME, QRP, aircraft scatter, low frequency beaconing, meteor scatter. But the two we're interested in, FT4 and FT8 tonight. Um, to keep this a little technical, here's a discussion about it. Uh, this was a, the FT comes from K9AN. And K1J2's last names are Frankie and Taylor. Uh, up until recently, G4WJS was involved. Unfortunately, he uh, suddenly died recently at a quite young age, kind of surprising. And IV3NWV is also involved in the software team. Um, as you can see, FT8 has eight tones separated by 6.25 hertz. And so it takes a 50 hertz bandwidth. Its advantage is it goes down a sensitivity of minus 24. And you're going to ask me if I can really work a station below that far below the noise floor. And the answer is yes. I've done that. And actually, I'll show you a screen from somebody I've worked down that low. FT4, on the other hand, is much quicker. It has a seven and a half second time slot time. 
And what and I'll explain what that does in a minute, what that means. But it has a, about six dB less sensitivity. Um, so you're going to ask what to do. Well, you download the software and you need to set up some basic things in the software to use it. Um, but the first thing is to make sure your clock is right on time. And in Windows, it's relatively easy. If you go to the uh, tray on the bottom where the time and the date is displayed, right click on that tray and you'll get a selection of menus. And one of them is adjust date time. You click on that. And at the bottom of that screen, you'll see a thing that says sync and it'll sync your computer to, to the Microsoft time server. And that'll get your clock very close. I have an alternate way of checking it, and I can tell you it works very well. Um, the software has hundreds of settings, as with every modern piece of software. So what I'm going to show you is the basic information to get on. Uh, uh, K1JT has a startup guide on that WSJT.X website. I suggest looking at that. There's also another startup guide I'll show you at the end of the presentation that's very good from G4I FB. Uh, both are very good uh, and will get you through it. A couple of thoughts on your radio. No, no matter what band you're on, set your radio on upper side band. 160, 80, and 40, I know the convention for side band is to go lower, but for FT8, the, the software assumes you're on upper side band. Do not filter the audio for the, those of you who have the newer radios that have audio filtering available. And even an FT 1000 MP from 20 years ago has audio filters. Turn them off. They will not help. Do not use speech compression. This is not single side band. And don't use a narrow SSB filter. And the reason why is people, people are going to be in little groups over the two and a half kilohertz of the audio bandwidth, and you don't want to knock off people that are trying to talk to you. If you use a narrow, like a 1.8 kilohertz filter, you'll lose people who are trying to call you at 2.2 kilohertz up from the channels. So what happens when you turn on the software, you go to file and you're going to get this general menu that says, what do I need to fill in? And the two important things are to put your call sign in, and your grid square in a six digit grid square, and you can get your grid square a variety of ways. Um, if you don't know what your grid square is and your address is a non post office box, qrzcq.com typically shows, if you put your call in, it'll typically show you your six digit um, grid square if you don't know what it is. So again, it's very important you do this. This is a do once and forget idea unless you change calls or change locations. So you put those two in, you hit OK. The, the system remembers it. Um, you'll ask why this is so important. I can tell you that a lot of new people get on call CQ when it says CQ, CQ, and no call sign because they never ended their call sign. The call sign you're putting here in the grid square are used to create the automatic messages. So they need to be in the software for the software to work. Again, you pick a mode. Like I said, WSJT has multiple modes, but the only ones we're concerned about are FT4 and FT8. So that's what you would do. And by the way, I'd like to encourage anybody who has a question to sound off. I'll be more than glad to try to answer it, but I will give time for questions at the end. So once you've done that, you're going to see this thing where a bunch of colors come up behind calls in their text. If you see a white background, that's just current traffic on the receive channel. If you see um, green, that's a station calling CQ. Yellow is what your transmissions are. And red is people directly calling you. So... The software is very good at telling you what's going on. So let's take a look. This is the first, I turned this on the other day, and this is a slot of stuff that was on 20 meters. And you'll notice two guys are in green, 7X3WPL and EA3HKA. They're obviously uh, of calling CQ. Everybody else in here isn't calling CQ. They're working somebody. So they're white in the background. 
So this helps you to tell where things are happening. Now let's take a look here. This is another important thing. There are a bunch of buttons here and I wanna explain what a couple of them do. First is the enable transmit button. Once you turn that on and your time slot time comes up, your transmitter will automatically go into transmit. If for any reason you decide to, to halt, there's a halt button next to it. I'll show that on the next screen. The other button that's kind of interesting is tune. You're gonna say, well, I need to set up my transmitter with the right audio level for either my interface or, or the interface inside of my radio. This allows you to do that by giving you a constant carrier at the right level. So you see that. So once you've done that, again, you have the capability to halt. The other thing that's interesting is a button over to the left here that says CQ only. If you only want to answer people calling CQ or find out who they are, you click that button and only pe in the band activity window, only the people who are calling CQ will show up. For newer people, it's very helpful because look at this scroll of stuff here. It gets people really confused. Where on the other hand, if you call CQ, because when you want to work somebody, all you do is you go on the on top of their call and double click, left click on it, and you'll be on if you're in enable transmit working uh, calling them. Now, what happens when you call CQ? In my case, I'm uh, I'm calling CQ here at KI five AH answered me, who's minus twenty four dB into the noise. And literally, I did complete this QSO with him. He's down south, as is obvious by the call. You'll notice the enable transmit button in the middle of the screen is on. It's red. So that's how come I was talking to him. I'm going to go through a typical QSO, and this happens to be with MMC B, uh, BDJ oh, in uh, Scotland. Again, yellow is a transmitting and red is what I'm receiving. Let's talk about what all these columns mean. On the left is each time, each, each activity is time stamped, hours, minutes, seconds. To the extreme right is whatever text is being sent. This is automatically generated in the software. The audio frequency, and you'll notice his audio frequency and mine are not the same. That's very common in FTA. People pick a channel with it with it's clear and tour and transmit on it, and people on another on another audio frequency will answer them. Very common. You can both synchronize. There is a way to do it, but it's not necessary. The next one is this column. You'll notice when I'm transmitting in yellow, it says TX. Hard to believe that's transmit. And when it's somebody else, I'm receiving somebody else, it gives me their signal strength. And you'll notice MM0 BDJ started out at minus 16, then he went 18 dB down, then he came back up to 11. We're all familiar with fading on 20 meters. Surprise, it, it actually detects that. The last column is the one you see on the red bars, which is a decimal number. That is the difference between my computer clock and his. You ideally want this to be within 10% of the sequence width which is the one point, uh, the 15 seconds for FTA and the seven seconds for FT4. You'd like them to be about 10% of that. And as you can see, I am. <laughs> so let's take a look. I called CQ. He responded and you'll notice at the end, he has IO88. That's his grid square that I'm working, that I'm, uh, sent me that I'm working. I then send them a signal report. My, the computer picks it up from the, the software. He then sends me a signal report. And this, the advantage of this is now he sends an R. And you might ask what the R means. It means he received my previous signal report and I'm at minus 15. I then sent, I've received your report and say 73. And most people send 73 at the end. It's not really necessary because you've already got signal reports exchanged in the locations, but it's a nice courtesy and the system does it automatically. You can avoid that. You can go over it, but most people do it. And then I called CQ again. The minute I send RR73 or I get an RR73 from another state, I get a log screen. And I'm not going to go in how to pull the log data up because it varies with whatever logging program you're going. 
But you'll notice I work, in this case, I worked HB9 DHG. It gets the start and end times. It gets the report sent. It gets the band, the mode, uh, who is the operator. You can put in comments. You can uh, set your tra uh, indicate your transmitter power here, all that great stuff. Now, this is what happens when I worked HB9 DHG. You'll notice, and I want you to look at the right picture, which is the receive window I'm using. I, I called him because he was calling. And then we went down and we had to try a couple of times to get a complete exchange and we did. Uh, and then at the end, you'll see HB9 DHG again is calling CQ in a green bar, but because I'm on that receiving frequency, I'm hearing him do that. This is very common. This is what you'll typically see. Um, You'll note that on the left, you, you don't have the yellow bars because it doesn't show your transmitting in the band activity band that only shows it in the receive frequency band where you're working the person. Uh, again, this is pretty straightforward. It does this automatically. You don't have to understand what it's doing in the background. A couple of things. When your time slot comes up, what's going to happen? Your radio is going to key, and you're going to see it go to whatever power you get set. And it looks like the radio's keyed down or it's got a single tone into it. That's because the FT modes are what they call continuous envelope. They look like a single audio tone. So what happens is your radio will key up, and if you've got it set to 50 watts, the output meter will go to 50 watts and stay there for the whole, in the case of FT8, 15 seconds or almost, actually a little less than 15. Actually, and here it is, it's 12.6 seconds. And it'll continue to do that and every time your transmitting time comes up. Uh, now, because this is continuous duty, you may want to uh, take the stress off your radio by turning its power down to about half of what its rated output is. Um, most modern radios will take this. I know for a fact uh, the Providence Club W1OP has an uh, ICOM 7, uh, let's see, 7300 we're running on FT8 and our remote station that has over 39,000 QSOs on it and has been set at 100 watts the whole time and never blown up. Good sign because it's remotely operated. Um, also, a, a small note about ALC. When you set up the, uh, your uh, audio, you want to set your ALC so it's where it would be for the peaks on SSB. And please don't use a speech processor. It adds absolutely nothing to the situation. This is a continuous tone, basically. So speech processing does nothing. In receive, you're going to see the S meter come up, but it's not the station you're working. It's all the stations in the audio pass band. I'll show a picture of that in a minute. The S meter is showing everybody some together. Now, this morning on 20 meters, there were 35 guys on one time slot. All the signal levels got summed together, and that's what the, my S meter was showing. It was not uh, the individual station I was working. There is in the software a waterfall graph you could use, and I'm going to show it to you. And that will show you the signals in the pass band, the relative strengths. So let's take a look at that. I put the, I happen to put the uh, graph above on my radio, but I'm going to blow it up a little bit so you can see it. But before we do that, let's talk about some of these other things that are on here. The red bar and the waterfall graph above the graph is where my transmit channel is set. And you set that down below in that in the window in the middle of the screen. It also, there's a little block that so, says hold transmit frequency. You can follow everybody you're working if you're calling people calling Seku, but I, re I suggest if you find a clear spot to transmit, you just hit the hold transmit frequency and it'll keep you on that frequency where you're in the clear. This is especially nice on 40 meters. On 20, you can't always hear who's on the frequent uh the other frequent uh, i'm sorry on the band because of, you don't hear everybody adjacently to who you're working on the other hand on 40 and 80 and 160 you do 
The green bar on the top of the graph is, is where your receive frequency is set. And if you don't pick a channel, you can set a receive frequency to listen to. But then when you go to work, somebody click on them, it's going to automatically go to that. And this, I'm going to expand the waterfall graph a little. And I've got rid of some of the colors to make this a little easier to see. But what's going on here is you have to set this up to scan what you want. And ideally, you want to listen from about 200 hertz to 2,500 hertz. So I set it for four bins per pixel and a start at 200 hertz, and that allows this. Now, you'll notice there's little vertical bars uh, at each time shown here. Those, each one of those vertical bars is an individual station. In this case, the brighter the bar is, the stronger the station. Um, Similarly, on the bottom, you have the typical green oscilloscope graph, which is scanning the whole 2,500 hertz I've set up and saying, <coughs> where are the signals and how relatively strong are there? And it's showing you that directly. So this is what that screen looks like. This, by the way, was off 20 meters again. So that's why you see the number of signals you do. And you'll notice they do go up to 2,500 hertz. There are people scattered through the whole part of that audio band. Now you're gonna ask me what's better, FT8 or FT4? And the answer is neither. FT8's great, it's the more mature mode. It has a little bit more dynamic range. So there's a lot more activity. I've worked people, and I'll tell you that I don't work 12 or 60 meters. Every other band I've worked somebody. Um, FT4 is more popular on 20 and 40 and with the expeditions to increase QSO rates. 20 and 40, it's, you'll typically see somebody on FT4. There are discrete frequencies. And when you bring the software up, you can look at the frequency table and it'll tell you if you're on FT8, go to this frequency. If you're on FT4, go to another frequency. Uh, on, on 20 meters, it's 14074 is the FT8 frequency. Um, again, uh, there's a huge amount of act. There was a recent contact, uh, I'm sorry, article in the National Contest Journal that said 60% of the HF activity now is on FT8 or FT4. Odd to believe, but if, if you, uh, if you like me, scan the CW bands, you don't hear a lot of activity other than contests or the expeditions anymore. It's not good. I, I'm sad to hear that because I, it took me a lot to learn CW, but still, that's the answer. Um, I will admit that a lot of DXs absolutely hate FT8, FT4, because people are working so many stations that they took years to work on CW inside Uh And it, it, there's been the question of skill level, and there's also been the question you can't really have a rag chew. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But the fact of the matter is it does work. Uh, since July of 2019, I've had 3,000 QSOs. I've worked 104 countries and 50 states. Now, I'll tell you, for me to work 50 states on 160 years ago on CW and Sidebin took me 10 years from here <laughs> to get a worked all states award on 160. I know people now who are getting it in less than a year. Am I happy about that? Not really, but that's the facts of life. Everybody asks about a QSO version where you can have a rag chew of FT8 and FT4, and the WSJT package currently doesn't offer that. There's been talk of them putting something out, but in the meantime, KN4CRD in July, I'm sorry, in January 2019, released a similar software called JS8 Call, and he has a website for it. This is from the website. Uh, and to give you an idea, the guys at W1OP have a competition going on to see who can get on and work somebody. So I was number two. My uh, buddy KV4DN was number one. And it works. Uh, you can have a QSO. It's in 15 second slots. Uh, so if you type in more than 15 seconds of stuff, it adds to it and makes it work. The software is quite different than FT4 and FTA, both the way it works and how it looks. Uh, it uses 15 second framings. So 
if you send two letters over what one frame takes, it takes another 15 seconds. Uh, it doesn't seem as robust in QRM situations as FT8 and FT4. FT8 and FT4 tolerate QRM real well. This doesn't seem to me as good and it appears to have a little less sensitivity. The software has some little bugs, like for example, if two people come up on the same audio channel, occasionally you lose lock with the station you were working, but if you just double click on him again, he'll come back, him or her, him or her and away you'll go. Uh, there's nowhere near the FT activity that's on FT8 and FT4. This morning I did a JS8 queue, so I've been on a week on JS8 as part of this thing with the guys at the club. Um, there were six people on the band. On FT8 and FT4, there were 24. So there's more activity. But again, JS8's a newer mode. A lot of QRP stations want to have rag chews like it because it works and it allows them to have rag chews down into the mud. Uh, it works effectively down about 18 dB into the noise. I've had some nice rag chew QSOs with it in the last week. I uh, actually was on with a guy in Texas. And we started talking about Raspberry Pi PCs and operating systems. It was fun. Uh, it's a little different. I'm going to show you what the software looks like, just a picture. This is what it looks like. And it has a bunch of pre-canned stuff, just like F FT8 and FT4. But there's a weird button here to the left that you can, you can select. And it says HB. And it's called Heartbeat. And what it does is if you send Heartbeat, it sends out a little signal that says, does anybody hear me, basically? And if everybody who hears you, it will respond back if they have their heartbeat mode turned on. Uh, it's interesting to find out who's listening and who's... The bad feature of this software is that it can be run completely autonomously without an operator there. That's not a good thing. I don't like it. I have questions about if it's even legit, but that's how it's set up. Uh, KN4's uh, CRD has recently updated it to version 2.2. I'm sure there'll be more updates. Uh, you can have a real QSO just like you can on Teletype, just like you can on PSK31. It's just a little slower in the sense the data rate is lower and the 15-second uh, timing windows limit you a bit. But it works. Um, I mentioned that uh, G4IFB, who actually is also ZL2IFB, put together an operating guide, and he updates this quite regularly. The last upgrade was last September. It's an excellent guide. Uh, I'd suggest it. Uh, it explains a lot. What I was going to do, Larry, if you're, if you're good with this, is I'll PDF this presentation and send it to you, and you can sure. send it to your members so they'll have the links. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it up on our website, and also um, this video is being recorded. It'll also go up on the website, too. Okay, and again, you can get my email. My email is available on QIZ, but there it is in case somebody doesn't have it. I'd be glad to answer any questions. A few comments. Um, one is uh, some of us use um, DX Labs, and you can go directly from WSJTX to DX Labs, and then from there you can upload automatically to do uh, Logbook of the World, which is what mine does. Right. Um, and uh, Joe Taylor at one time lived and worked in the uh, Pioneer Valley, and he worked at UMass. Right. And um, he gave a talk to this club, I guess, 40 or 50 years ago, from what I've been okay. told, long before my time in it. Um, and uh, one thing you didn't mention, uh, maybe because you use a signal link and not a... Um, uh, direct uh, USB interface is setting the computer to the USB um, connection with the radio versus standard. Um, because it, if you're using a direct USB connection, uh, you're not, it's not going to work unless you tell the, the computer to use the USB to the radio connection. Right. And I, what I would heavily <clears throat> suggest is, and the reason I don't do that is every system's a little different. And what I want to recommend is uh, Joe Taylor's explanation on his website explains all that. And I would heavily recommend that people look at that. And also uh, 
ZL2 IFB goes through that in quite a bit of detail. One of, one of the things I've avoided is putting anything here that's different from, from radio to radio or system to system, because then it only confuses people. Right, right. Also, uh, JS8 call, um, we do have a meeting a month from now um, on that exact mode. So um, people okay. can get introduced to that too, so on, on yeah. a more detailed level. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, unmute yourself and um, raise your hand and we'll let you go. Uh, I have one. Okay, go uh, ahead, no, Jurgen first. I, I, I heard there's a mode that people use when there's a DX the expedition or so. How, how does that work? Right now, FT4 has a de expedition function that allows them to operate and and call two or three stations simultaneously. On it's called Fox and Hound. And on your end, it makes no difference. You set your software to Fox and Hound, and when you see the person you want to work. You hit the transmit button and away you go. And as soon as they get you, it starts the automatic key stone. But uh, in the software, if you go to the setup screen, if you're going to do that, you go to, there's a, a block that says, do you want to operate Fox and Hound? And you should check that block when you're trying to do that. Yeah, thanks. And it worked, by the way, just so you know, I've used, I've actually worked people without that turned on who were doing that and it still works. It's just a little harder. And by a little harder, I mean, you have to keep calling them. Harold? Yes, uh, thanks. Um, I've only used FT8 in CQ mode, which is okay. nice because I, I just sit back and somebody calls me. And I said, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> but if I see a station on the left side of the screen that's green, I'm assuming that I can just double click on that one. Correct. That's exactly what you do. You go, you, okay. you left click on them twice and they'll come up in your receive window. And as long as you're set to transmit, the next time your transmit period comes up, you'll transmit to them. Now, if, if the other guy's busy, I mean, I know he's calling CQ, but all of a sudden somebody sneaks out in front of me. Do I just sit and wait? You have two choices. I typically take, take and turn the transmitter off so he can complete his other QSO. And then wait until I see him saying RRR 73 to that person. And then I turn mine back on. That's what Excellent. I've done. Just to be Very courteous, good. because what he's going to see all these red bars showing up. I will tell you a, a sad story. I operate W1AW occasionally. And I do operate FT8 and FT4 from W1AW on, on occasion. And you cannot imagine how red the screen gets with <laughs> people calling W1AW. <laughs> <laughs> the whole the whole two sides of the screen fill up red. It's unbelievable. Okay, thank you, Dom. Very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody else? Quiet night. Nobody else has any questions or comments. Yeah, I have a, Larry. I have a comment. Um, we have an we have an uh, an interface that you can build yourself on our website. It's a little bit hidden. It's under actually on the SS uh, TV, I think, isn't it? Slow scan TV, yes. And there's a there's a board and 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 you do it yourself uh, interface for for less than five dollars. Oh, that's if great. That's fabulous. Yeah, it's um, and somebody else had a question too or a comment. Yeah, I have I have actually a question, Larry. Go ahead, lad. Uh, okay, Dom. Uh, one question: When you hold your TX frequency, I notice it does not stop you from transmitting when the station comes back from another signal. No, right. and you know that's confusing at first. Uh, Agreed, but that's why I say if you if if they're um. How can I phrase it nicely? You you have to take, and I'm going to hold on. Thank God, I've got another computer running over here so I can read what things say. I typically toggle enable transmit on and off to account for that. And I found that I feel better doing that because I don't transmit for no reason at all. On the other hand, when they're coming back, once you see somebody say RR73, you could basically turn your radio on transmit again, and you're going to be fine. Does that yeah, make sense, Larry? Uh, yeah, Lad, that, I'm sorry. yeah, that's yeah, um, yeah, that's that's what I do, you know, all the time. Right, and that's what I'd recommend. And, I hate 
truthfully, I hate causing QRM, uh, you know, and just continuously calling. I just don't see the sense in it if I know the guy's working somebody else until he says he's done with them. He or she. Okay. That was good. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I got one. Go ahead, Ray. Um, Dom, have you found um, over time that as the popularity of this mode has just skyrocketed, probably largely due to the low sunspots and FDA was basically the only thing that was getting out, do you find that there are a lot of stations nowadays that are pumping a little bit more than 100 watts out to these signals? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you a little secret. W1AW does, typically when I'm there, we try to run 100 watts. There are occasions where we run more. It's not a good idea, but we do it. because. But the trouble is... Um, when you start running more than four or 500 watts, uh, you get so many people calling back, it's silly. Um, I know that Joe at the, at the league never, I mean, he has the capability to run 1,500 watts key down forever with the amplifiers he's got. We, I've never seen him set above 400 watts, even on uh, when somebody who's new on FT8 goes on there. Uh, the last time I was there in December, I never put on, I used an F, his uh, TS, um, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, eight, the 480 he has there, the uh, Kenwood, and I stayed at 100 watts and I was fine. Um, but you will see people trying to take over. The biggest problem I see is misadjusted transmitters. You'll see signals that should be 50 hertz wide, 100 hertz wide, because they're overdriving the amplifier. They don't have the ALC turned down and they're cranking against an older radio where the ALC is a little sharp and widens everything up when it hits it. Um, that's the biggest problem with running amplifiers. And there's no need to run an amplifier, to be honest. Um, yeah, not to mention the fact that, you know, you're, you're using 100 watts. I'm using 100 watts because I just don't have an amplifier and I'm trying to work stations and all of a sudden you get these and you see the you know, quarter inch wide uh, transmit signals. And, you know, basically, you know that your signal is getting drowned out. You want this contact. But, uh, you know, and then you get one of those lucky ones, like uh, just before I came on board here, I found um, Antarctica and I worked them on FT8 on 17 meters. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, I've got to say the truth. Uh, it's like every hand mode. <laughs> People want to crank up the power. They think it's better. This is, this is a mode that's really designed not to use power on HF. Um, and I think that's why some of the QRP guys, and this is my own opinion, are going to JS8. It's a little less busy, and they have a better chance with, than all this crud people running a kilowatt or trying to you know, do on uh, FT8. They're having trouble competing with them because you, know, you still got to get an RF signal through. And if somebody buries you with a kilowatt, you're not going to get through. I regularly run probably around 40 watts on my uh, TS-890. And right. uh, on occasion, if I sit there for a while, I'm trying to work, usually trying to work a DX station, I'll crank the power down and turn the amplifier on. I think the most I've ever run is a little over 200 watts. But right. just, just trying to work the station after a while, you know, you, <laughs> you kind of get aggravated. You're sitting there for a few hours trying to work the guy and finally I reach a point where I you know, just kick the amp on and then work them on the first uh, first couple of calls. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. I'll admit that that's an issue, and unfortunately, there's no way you can control that because everybody's own station is their own station. They work it the way they want to work it. Um, if I if it was my choice, everybody would be like on ten meters at two hundred watts. You're stuck. That's the end of it. <laughs> but that's not how it works. I can't, and I also have the same argument with guys on CW who are calling with a kilowatt and have no receive capability on 160. And, you know, they'll call CQ and junk up the band, but they can't hear anybody because they get S9 noise wherever they are. So, you know, unless you're running another, you are running a kilowatt, they're not going to hear you. I've uh, got a neighbor three streets away that runs a kilowatt and a half all the time. Yeah. I have... Um, 
I have the odd experience of for uh, anybody who's on 160 for the contest. If you've worked W1OP between 1 a.m. and 7 a.m., you've probably worked me <laughs> uh, because I'm the night operator over there for a contest on 160. And um, that's one thing that drives me crazy. I'll call, I'll hear, I'm running a kilowatt and we run actually right now around 1100 Watts. Um, and when I call people and they can't hear me, that's a bad sign if I'm hearing them. And there's more than a few of those. They don't have a good receiving situation. So they, but they continue to call at full power. Like they can hear everybody. It drives me crazy. <laughs> Well, in 160, you, even on FT8, I mean, I have plenty of times I hear someone who's above zero uh, and uh, he can't hear me. And right. I'm running about 40 watts, but and I don't have the best of antennas, but you think if he's above zero, it should be a slam dunk of a QSO. I agree with you, lad, but you know, you'd be surprised. I, I have at my home QTH here in Natick, I have an S8 noise level continuously on 160. So I don't even try to be competitive from here. If I get on, I just go down to play around. Uh, the Providence Club, we're very lucky. We're in a location that's next to a public park. Uh, there's a broadcast station running 15 kilowatts on FM next to us. But the other side of our facility is, uh, uh, comes up against the public park. So we don't have a huge amount of noise. Um. And so at night, it actually is a good site. Um, but it's it. I have to admit that that's the biggest problem on 160, 80, and even to some degree 40, people who, who have huge power but can't hear. And I, I agree with you, lad. It's kind of funny. You know, you go by the numbers. They should, they should be able to hear you, no problem. Cool. Uh, anybody else have any other questions or comments? No? No, thank you very much, Dom. Very interesting, very informative. My pleasure. And uh, all this will be available on the website very soon. Uh, two weeks from tonight, we have uh, Traffic Handling and the Radiogram um, by Marsha, KW1U. And then uh, a month from now, we have JS, JS8 Call, which uh, we'll get into it deeper then. And we've got uh, SOTA coming up, W1QSL Bureau, and using propagation prediction software. And that'll take us through March and April of two, uh, two share the knowledge sessions per month. In addition to the, uh, the monthly meeting and the March meeting is um, the New England uh, Forest Rally Communications by um, Paul W1SEX. So that should be really interesting, really different um, and a lot of fun too. So, but thank you very much, Dom. I, I met Dom at uh, W1AW back in December, end of November, December. And um, we got to talking and uh, you, you put on a great and very interesting meeting tonight. So we thank you very much. Thanks very much for inviting me and have a good one. Yeah, you too. Stay healthy and good luck and good DX in the future. You uh, too. Wishing everybody a good evening and um, thanks for joining us tonight. Hopefully everybody learned something and uh, we'll see, hopefully hear you on the air and see you soon. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Good night. Good night, all.